So before I begin, I want us to think about what does God say about learning and education? Have we stopped to think about that? Did we even think there's a link between God and learning and, and education? Well, I think there's a link between the two. And I found the perfect verse. The perfect verse is found as displayed on the screen in Daniel 1 verses 17. And it reads as follows. As for those, to, as for those four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had an understanding in all vision, visions and dreams. When I interpreted this message, with, sorry, this Bible verse, I interpreted it as the way that God wants us to learn. God wants us to get an education. He wants us to learn more so that we are able to understand him more, so that we're able, we're able to understand his vision, his dream, and his whole creation. And for this reason, this is why I specifically like in this text, the first part that reads as follows. As for these, the, these four children, I want us to park at these four children. These were four boys, and these boys were different. God didn't give them knowledge, God didn't give knowledge to one child, but he gave knowledge and skill and learning to four children. Therefore, meaning that God gives knowledge and skill in four, not, not to, to, to limit it to four children, but he gives knowledge and skill to different children, not one specific type of children, but to different, all different children who present differently. I want us to understand that because sometimes when we have presentations as of this nature, we tend to forget about the different children and we tend to focus on only one type of child or one type of child. So in this presentation, as much as I can, I will try to include every single child so that no one is left behind because at the end of the day, everyone goes to school and receives some sort of education. So when do we think a child starts to get ready for school? This is a question that I pose to my husband and to my family. When do we think a child gets ready for school? So my husband, luckily for him, our daughter just started school. She's four years old and she just started preschool this year. In fact, this month. So I posed this question to him and his, his answer was obvious that a child begins school at the age of four, and that's when they start getting ready for school and being equipped for school, which is not a wrong answer. I, asked, I posed this um, question to my family as well, my parents and my mother-in-law. My parents thought that children start in pre-primary, start to get ready for school in pre-primary, the same as for my mother-in-law, which is still not wrong. All of these all of these responses were correct responses. But in actual fact, I just want us to know that children start learning as soon as they are born. As soon as they open their eyes and they're able to follow and track an object, that's when they begin to learn. This is what I want us to go home with, knowing that a child doesn't start learning when they're about to start high school or when they're about to start grade one. They start as soon as they are born. Um, sorry, as we, before we begin today, I want us to also think about, um, as leaders for children's ministries and as parents for children between the ages of zero to 14, how does your child compare to the following components that I will be going into detail and explaining? I don't want everyone to be alarmed. Some, some terminology will be new but I promise you that it's information that you already know is just termed differently in the occupational therapy world. So I want us to look at four, four important component areas that are needed for school readiness. These components you get throughout your life. So just like I mentioned earlier on, a child begins to learn from the age of zero. So these are the four component areas that help shape a child to be ready for school. The first one is motor. The second one is cognitive. The third one is psychosocial. And the last one is sensory. I will be going into detail with each component and what it means for the child and how this component 
gets the child ready for school. The first component we're going to be looking at is motor component, which is also known as the physical component. Physical component. Um, this is basically your child's tone, their strength, patterns of movement, posture, gross motor, and fine motor. So because of time and because this is a presentation, I will not be going into detail with everything, but I'd like to look at these specific two subcomponents that are influential in the physical component areas. So the first one is gross motor. Like I said, gross motor um, refers to the child's strength. So your big movements that your child does. So can your child jump? Does your child skip? Do they engage in extramural activities? This is for the older children at school. Does your child do any type of play at school? At home or at church, do they engage in big play? Do they explore and play in the playground when they see a playground? Can everyone hear me? Sorry, I think I was muted there for a second. Yeah, if you okay. can just repeat what you last said, Sasha. On gross motor, play. Yes, please. Okay. So I was explaining there were four components that we're going to be looking at this evening. This one is the first component that helps facilitate um, a child getting ready for school. This is part of also a child's development. So the first one we're looking at is physical, also known as motor component. So because of time, I won't be going into everything that um, the physical aspect um, comprises of, but I will be explaining the gross motor term and the fine motor term. So the, fine, the gross motor term is basically um, your child's tone, their strength, their patterns of movement, posture. Um, gross motor specifically refers to big muscle movements that your child does. So can your child jump? Do they run? Are they able to run? Can they skip? Do they engage in any extramural activities? This is this one is for the older ones. So do they play any sports at school? Um, the reason why gross motor development is important is it, it's because it helps with the child's concentration. So gross motor um, gross motor skills develop at a very young age. So your child at maybe six months is able to crawl. And then being able to crawl helps them because it strengthens them enough for them to be able to sit and walk. So if a child misses that stage, I know us as Africans, we like thinking, oh, if my child misses a certain stage and they don't crawl and they just jump to walking, we get happy and we think, oh, this child is going to be brilliant. I'm not saying this child is wrong or this child isn't brilliant. Definitely your child is 100% brilliant but they need to learn how to crawl. These are the gross motor skills that are needed that affect concentration. Because let's say your child skips crawling, they'll skip crawling, they'll go through everything else, and then now she's in grade one. Now it's time for her to concentrate in class. And because she skipped that big muscle movement, she isn't able to sit up straight and hold the correct posture, which then affects their concentration as school. Well. So we must, at a very young age, encourage our children to play. So when your child goes to school and they have break times in school, encourage your child that they must play, they must play games with other children, encourage your child to play and not watch other people do it because this is needed for their growth. This is needed in order for them to be excellent in learning and in school. The second subcomponent I will be looking at is fine motor. Uh, excuse me, but my screen isn't sharing. So it's not moving to the next slide. I'll stop sharing just for one second. Let's see.
Okay, so I am having difficulties with sharing my screen and moving it, but I will continue. The second subcomponent that we're looking at is fine motor. So your fine motor skills. Your fine motor skills refers to the little muscle movements, uh, small muscle movements that your child does. So can your child write? Can they draw? Can they color in? Do they struggle with cutting? Do they struggle with anything that requires the small muscle movement? Um, fine motor skills are very important to foster a child's independence, and also this ha also helps them improve their hand-eye hand coordination, which also has an influence on their attention and also um, on and and also their concentration. So gross motor skills affects also our fine motor skills. So with the same example, that child who isn't able to uphold their posture in class might have a poor handwriting, or you might be a mom who's struggling with your child who has this poor handwriting and at school, they're always complaining that oh, your child isn't able to write well and they num like their numbering and their letters aren't forming well. This is because their fine motor skill hasn't developed the way that it should have at their age group. Um, I also included ways and activities that improve gross motor, uh, gross motor and fine motor skills. This presentation will also be available to everyone so that they can also go through it at home in case they need it or referencing or in case they want to share with anyone. So activities that can improve if you have a child who's struggling with their gross motor skills include crawling, the child playing hopscotch, um, your child playing extramural activities, by extramural activities, I mean your child engaging in rugby at school, or maybe playing hockey, or maybe playing netball. These are the various skills that your child can engage in to improve this specific gross motor skill. For fine skills, your child, you can, you can, you can, you can so you can you can help your child by um, encouraging independent eating by them drawing or writing or creating a mosaic mosaic using old magazines. So I don't know if you remember, but in the olden days, I remember while I was in primary school, we used to tear paper into little pieces and fill up the whole image to make a complete image. So, for example, we'd make a person using small little like we'd get the shape of the of the let's say a human and then we'd have to tear into little tear the little pieces and fill that image in by small papers that that creates a mosaic so at home you can do this to help your child um develop the fine motor skills you can also help your child develop the fine motor skills by encouraging them to be independent as much as they can. So putting their socks on at home, being as independent as they can, because this later affects the child's growth and development specifically for school readiness. The second component we're going to be looking at is cognitive. So under cognitive, I'll also, there's a lot that goes under cognitive, but because of time, I'll only be focusing on two subheadings. So the first one, is attention and concentration. So attention and con concentration refers to your child's ability to engage in one task and complete it. So is your child able to engage in a task? How long do they take before they get distracted? Can they complete the task? What hinders them? This is basically how alert your child is during an activity. This could be them getting dressed. How long do they get before they get distracted? How long does it take for them to get distracted? Um, the second component is problem solving. Can your child find a solution to a problem? Um, this cognitive component com comprises sorry, of various different things. I'm not sure if everyone can hear me, but it just said my connection is stable. So I just need an indication if everyone can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can. All right. Thank you so much. 
The second subcomponent, as I was saying, is problem solving. Can your child find a solution to a problem by themselves? So, for example, the child could be faced with any problem, um, something that's foreign to them. Okay? Are they able to maneuver around it and find solutions to the problem without your assistance? The cognitive aspect is very important in a child's well-being because that's where they, they get the memory comes in, where they need to plan accordingly. There's a lot that goes in under cognitive. So this is important in, in a child's growth because then it helps, it, it helps enhance a child's learning in school and outside of school. We must remember that learning starts throughout. It doesn't only start at school, it goes on at home. It's an ongoing process. So it happens at school, it happens at home, and it happens in the church. Um, I'm trying to move to the next slide. Okay, so I've also included activities that improve cognitive skill. For attention and concentration, I've included that children need to spend less time on phones and watching TV. So basically what you can do for your child so that they can have they can increase their uh, attention and concentration in the school is that you limit your ex their access to TV and promote outdoor play for them. So I did say earlier on that a child really does help with concentration. It helps the child be able to be focused, and it helps the child with problem solving. Sorry, problem solving also Oh, sorry, I wanted to go into the activities that improve um, problem solving. So the activities that improve that you can work on to improve your child's problem solving skills include um, playing puzzles with your, your child, children, um, playing board games. This will encourage your child to be able to figure out or find solutions to the problem that is presenting to them. So how you find solutions to the problem is, is you can play puzzles, but I also know that not everyone is able to afford that puzzle. So I know that you can also create puzzles at home. You can make puzzles. Um, if everyone, if anyone actually wants to make a puzzle and needs We've lost our presenter. Let's just see if she can come back on. Viewers, please be patient. We are just trying to get her back on. Uh, Pastor Cordell, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I think she should convert the presentation into a PowerPoint, into PDF. Then it's easy to run through. It doesn't have to render graphics. It will just run it as a file and it will be easier like that as well.
Hello. Hi. We can hear you. Yes. Hello. Sasa, please continue. Oh, I'm so sorry, everyone. Um, we've experienced load shedding. So I'm so sorry for that. I'm not sure where I left everyone, but I think I left it under the activities that people can do at home with their children to facilitate problem solving. So for problem yeah, solving that's correct. activity, oh, the activities that you can do at home is playing puzzles with your children. So playing puzzles, does sorry can everyone see now yes we can see the presentation okay thank you so <clears throat> for problem solving i did say playing puzzles with your children playing board games helps facilitate um prob the pr problem solving aspect in your child's cognitive um skills so if you can't afford to buy puzzles because i know they can be quite expensive what you can do is that you can make puzzles and i'm happy to help facilitate making puzzles to whoever is interested in making puzzles for their children this will also be a nice way for you to also add the fine motor skills to have a look at your children's fine motor skills and have a look at where they stand with their fine motor skills the next component we're going to be looking at is your psychosocial component. This is your third, this is our third component. So for our psychosocial component, sorry, I'm just struggling so much with my network. We do have load shedding. So for our psychosocial, it has two subheadings. For psychosocial, it's got social interaction and self-esteem. So social interaction is basically how your child is able to interact with other children. Can they interact with other children? Are they able to explore their surroundings and explore their environment when, in, when they are in a new environment? Or are they shy? Do you have a shy child at home who's unable to interact with other children. Um, social interaction plays a very big role in a child's read in, in the child's readiness for school because it shows that a child is able to interact with other children to retain and learn new information regarding other children and their whole environment. The self-esteem component, second component refers to how confident your child is. Do they ask for assistance when they need it or are they shy or they keep to themselves and they don't want to interact and they can't ask questions and they can't ask for help. I do also want to say a confident child being that they're confident and they're doing things right. A confident person or confident child does ask for help and should ask for help. So if you have a child who's struggling with social interaction, as well as a low self-esteem, I do have some activities that you can try to have to in, implement at home so that their, their skills improve, their psychosocial skills improve at home. So for social with other children, sorry, that are in the same age group with your child, um, this could either be um, someone who goes to school with your child or someone who's from church who's of the same age group with your child so paying for a child is how they learn but it's very important for them to socially interact as well as for them to play and you can only facilitate that by encouraging play dates i know 
us as Africans, we don't like play dates. And I'm not saying that children, they must go sleep over at other people's houses. I'm just saying them having a group of friends really goes a long way for their interaction, for their, for their psychosocial development. The, the fourth and final one that we're going to be looking at is your sense, sensory skill. So your sensory skill is your child's ability to interpret and organize information from the senses of their body and their environment. So it's important, like I said earlier on, that we include every child in this presentation. So some children generally are overstimulated and they are on the autism spectrum. So they can present as being overstimulated or understimulated. Maybe when they're, I'm just making an example of someone who is overstimulated, just in case someone doesn't clearly understand autism. So a child who presents like with overstimulation may be, may, may struggle with handling a group of people, like making them, they, the child acts out in various different ways when they're around different, like a lot of people. Maybe it's too noisy for them. You'll see them with their heads over, with their hands over their ears or they're hiding, or they get angry. Children, children, when they're frustrated, they play out in different ways. So I'm just making an example of children who can be overstimulated. Um, this is how they would act. What kind of foods does your child eat? This is also the second subcomponent that affects the child. So the foods that go in your, in your, in your child's mouth does have an effect on the sensory input, like it does have an effect on their learning, their overall all learning. Do they eat junk food? Do you even make them lunch? Do, do they have a favorite unhealthy food that you buy for them? I know when I was young, I used to love potato chips, which is also known as slap chips. I used to love slap chips and every day my mom would bring me slap chips. So do you have a child like that who likes a specific unhealthy food that by doing that and providing them with that specific unhealthy food, you're hindering them for their school readiness. You are hindering them for being ready for school and learning and reaching their ultimate like goals. So in order for you to try and, and for your child to facilitate that growth, you must try and replace the unhealthy foods with the healthy foods. So I've listed here on the screen the types of food that we can eat um, that are good for actually the brain development. So I know walnuts, berries, and fish for maybe the older kids are very good foods that can help a child with um, their brain development. On the next slide, sorry, on the next slide, which I'm still having problems with, but every, don't worry, everyone will be able to get the, this presentation afterwards. Um, on the next slide, I just basically give um, a, an example of a child who is autistic and struggles with overstimulation, what the mother can do. So if you do have a child who is is autistic, you can maybe um, try to find out what, you, what, what makes your child calm, what type of stuff calms your child down. So for the overstimulated child that I made an example of who gets frustrated in a group of people, around a group of people and puts their hands over their ears and act out in different ways because they're frustrated of the, because of the overstimulus. You can't get earphones for your child. And when your child isn't around on the group of people, they wear earphones so that it, they don't get too overstimulated and they are able to engage with other children. This is, for church and also outside church. And this could be also um, at school so that children also 
it is to other children who are different to them, who have different challenges, but also want to learn. Um, basically, that is the end of my slideshow.